questions. It's a very extraordinary day for us here at Winter School. Not only will our students have the opportunity to ask questions of the astronauts at the International Space Station, but we will also have the opportunity to connect with a former Winter High School graduate. Jeff Williams, who is the son of Eunice and Jake Williams, who are here with us today, is an astronaut with NASA, and he graduated from Winter High School in 1976. So we're very excited to have him share a little bit of his career, which started with his education right here in Winter School. So our students are ready for their questions. We're ready to begin. I would like to invite Mr. Zop up. He is going to introduce the students as they prepare to answer or ask their questions. Mr. Zop. Thank you, Dr. Boylo. And in the interest of time, we're going to get right to the questions. Can I bring our first asker up? She is a senior here at Winter, Ms. Liz Sweeney. This question is for Jeff. How is carbon dioxide removed from the cabin air in the space station? Liz, that's a great question because, you know, we live in an enclosed environment here, and every time we exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide. So we have to remove it in order to keep, maintain a healthy atmosphere. We have two uh, machines, you could say, or two uh, things on board that scrub the air, and they run the air basically through it, one in the Russian segment and one in the U.S. segment. Um, and there's a, a chemical uh, absorbent bed inside that machine that takes out the CO2 as the air uh, flows through it, and that's how we maintain the required low CO2 level. Thank you, Jeff. Um, our next asker is an eighth grade student here at Winter, Ms. Brianna Pfeiffer. This question is for Suichi. Would you someday like to go to Mars? Go to Mars. Hello, Brianna. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, sure, I'd like to go to Mars and the moon may be a fun place, but uh, the, the planet I want to go to right now is the Earth, actually. I'm looking at the Earth every day. It's just a beautiful place, and you guys are lucky to be there, actually. So I'm, I will be here for six months. I'll be now uh, wanting to go back to, to this beautiful planet Earth. Thank you, Soichi. Our next question is from an 11th grader at LCO Ojibwe School, Mr. Tony Roach. This question is for Jeff. Could you please explain what handheld motion conversation is? Well, it's a very technical term. It sounds technical, but it's actually very simple. If you were to, for example, be at a racetrack watching a race car go by and trying to take a picture of it, you would track the race car with your camera so that the, it didn't end up being blurred on the uh, on the image. Now, the background might be blurred because you're you're panning across the the background, uh, but you'd get a clear picture of the uh, of the race car. We do the same thing because we're going 17,500 miles around the Earth. We're 220 miles above the Earth's surface, uh, but the er surface of the Earth is moving fairly rapidly by the window. So if we're using a camera like this, and this is one we typically use, it's got an 800 millimeter lens, all we do is look through the viewfinder, uh, track the object on the Earth that we want to take pictures of, and simply move the camera. And that's uh, what that, it sounds like a very complicated term, but, but it's actually very simple. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question to ask her is a senior here at Winter, Mr. Jason Snell. This question is for Jeff. The handheld camera must take pictures through four panes of material. Why isn't there a camera outside the cabin that is remote controlled so there would be even less distortion in the photos? 
Well, actually, we do have video cameras outside. We use those for robotic operations, for following um, uh, spacewalks, uh, for approaching uh, vehicles like the space shuttle or the Soyuz or a Progress uh, cargo ship. Uh, but you're right, we don't, as a rule, have a still camera out there. We take all of the still photography through the windows. The windows are thick, and as you said, there are multiple panes, but they're very high-quality glass. So even with a lens this big, we don't get a whole lot of distortion in the imagery. And I'm sure you've seen some of the imagery taken by astronauts from the space station, and it's actually very clear. And you can actually pick out the streets in, uh, in winter there and the school building that you're sitting in and the pictures that we take with this lens. Thanks, Jeff. Our next question is going to be asked by an eighth grade student here at Winter, Ms. Brittany Thompson. This question is for TJ. Has any space junk ever hit the space station? That's a, not only an important question, but also a bit of a tough question for us. Um, to the best of my awareness, nothing um, huge, nothing sizable has ever hit the station. We do see some I indications on our windows of, of tiny little pock marks. So maybe some of the micrometeorite little visitors have come by and glanced off of, of us. But since I mentioned that, let me share two other th thoughts. Uh, we do have a little bit of shielding on, on our space station so that... Um, the micrometeorites, if they hit us, basically vaporize and, and don't do any damage. And the second thing I'll tell you is if something sizable is coming towards us, we have uh, radar systems around the world that track these these larger objects. And if it gets looks like it's going to be getting close enough to us, we actually go into a, a procedure, a... a, a a, an action where we all go sit in our lifeboats and ready to immediately depart should something bad happen to the space station. So we have ways of dealing with, with the impending danger. Thanks, TJ. Our next question will be asked by a senior here at Winter, Mr. Ryan Sidera. This question is for Suichi. How do you find the mass of an object at zero gravity? Hey, Ryan, that's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. I'd like to give a, a small uh, demonstration. Uh, we have a winter high school graduate here. He volunteered to help me. <laughs> here we have a water bag, weighs about uh, 90 pounds on the ground. Of course, here it's zero gravity. It's like a feather. But using the two uh, springs, and uh, you can measure just like this, measure the timing between this uh, up position and down position with the known spring coefficients. We can get the mass uh, by uh, equations. So uh, this is the way we measure and define the mass in space. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by a ninth grade student here at Winter, Mr. Devin Sirfoss. This question is for TJ. Have you ever had any technical difficulties on the ISS? Thanks, Devin. Um, yeah, from time to time we do, but the nice thing is our systems have redundancies. Uh, for instance, just the other day, one of our two communication channels had a bit of a problem. We could hear the ground talking to us, but the ground couldn't hear us. So we swapped over to the, to the second comm channel while the ground worked on troubleshooting the, the problem. Sure, occasionally we have, we have problems, but we're not single string and such that one failure would take us out completely. We use that redundancy to help us get around the problem until we can fix the original problem. Thank you, TJ. Our next question will be asked by an 11th grade student here at Winter, Ms. Keila Strofe. This question is for Jeff. 
is any research being done on long-term space travel and the dangers of high energy radiation? Well, there's a lot of work that we uh, do up here that will prepare us for leaving Earth orbit, for going back to the moon, onto Mars and whatnot. One of the things, as you point out, that we're concerned about is uh, radiation protection. We pretty much know about the, what radiation can do and the damage that it can cause. Uh, and we continually monitor the radiation environment here, and there are scientists on the ground that predict higher levels of radiation, for example, from sunspots or whatnot. And on occasion, we will go to a, a portion of the space station that has more protection than other parts of the space station uh, to protect us from that higher dose of radiation. Uh, but again, the, uh, the, the big thing is uh, protecting uh, crews, uh, especially when we leave Earth orbit and go to places like Mars. Uh, we're going to have to uh, have more protection there. Uh, so, yeah, there is a lot of work going on. Uh, on a broad spectrum of uh, categories, we are working to prepare uh, for future space exploration on board the International Space Station, and that's just one topic that we're studying. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question will be asked by a senior here at Winter, Ms. Danny Rinda. This question is for Jeff. Is time different on Earth relative to the space station? Well, there's a couple ways to answer that. If you were to uh, to compare the time going on the on the clock, you know, watching the second hand go, the seconds would pass at the same speed here as down there. Uh, but subjectively, we feel the passing of time differently up here. You see the sunrise in the morning, unless it's a cloudy day, but you still see it get light, and you see it uh, get uh, dark in the evening. So there are a lot of cues on the Earth when you're on the Earth. Uh, that tell you the passing of a day, and, and we live our lives with that sense of time, largely. Up here, we don't have that. As you know, we go around the Earth uh, in 90 minutes, 16 times a day, so we can see lots of sunrises and sunsets. So really, we live on time according to our watch. And uh, the planners on the ground build a schedule for us. We typically wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to bed about 10 o'clock at night. And the time zone that we use is Greenwich Mean Time, which, of course, is in uh, uh, England. Uh, and occasionally we'll shift one way or another depending upon, say, a shuttle docking or a Soyuz docking or a spacewalk or something like that. But generally we live in the time for uh, that uh, is in England. There's a couple reasons, other reasons for that. We work with the Moscow Mission Control Center as well as the Houston Mission Control Center and other mission control centers in Japan and, and Europe. Um, and uh, that works out to be a convenient time for all of those locations around the, uh, the world as well. Thank you, sir. Our next question will be asked by an eighth grade student here, Ms. Veronica Snell. This question is for TJ. How long will NASA allow you to stay in space? <laughs> That's a good question. We keep asking that. Some people don't want me to come back. They're happy that I'm gone. Um, hey, you know, the... the, the that's under debate. I mean, for me to give you a legal answer, I, I can't give you a number of days. But it, the maximum is somewhere between, a, uh, I don't know, just a little bit over a year and a half. But before I answer that, I should also tell you that the gentleman who's got the longest history or longest record of being in space was actually a Russian that stayed over a year. And, and people are still gathering data on, on how his body is recover, has been recovering over the, over the years that he's, since he's returned. So to answer your question specifically about NASA, it's a little bit over, over a half a year. And we're kind of targeting somewhere between, uh, I don't know, 140 and 180 days for our mission. Next question will be asked by an 11th grade student here, Mr. Matthew Hargis. This question is for Suichi. 
How would you escape the space station in case of an emergency? Hey, Matthew. Uh, yes, uh, like a big cruise ship, uh, we have an uh, escape uh, boat, like a small tugboat uh, attached to the space station. Right now, we have five on board, and we have uh, two escape vehicles. Each seat, uh, each uh, vehicle has three seats, so we don't have to fight for the seat, actually. And uh, just in case of, like, emergency, each of us has a designated seat in this uh, escape vehicle and return to Earth safely. Thank you, Suichi. Our next question will be asked by an eighth grade student here, Mr. Matthew Desitel. This question is for Jeff. How do plants grow in space? Uh, good question, Matthew. We actually have had several experiments uh, involving plants to understand uh, how they grow. Uh, they grow actually pretty well. They grow toward a light source. So if you can have them upside down toward a light source, and they'll grow upside down or sideways or, or up toward the light source. But I have an example um, right here of a plant experiment that we had. As you know, there's, there are a lot of trees there around winter um, and in the north woods of Wisconsin. Um, and trees generally grow up. And uh, when branches, when there are big branches out, uh, hanging off the side of the tree, they actually found that the wood is different on top of the branch than below the branch. So we have a small willow tree here that we coiled up and let grow for a few weeks. And then we, uh, we took samples and preserved the wood uh, to see if we have the same effect because of a stress of bending on the wood. So that's just one example. At the other end of the space station in the Russian segment, we're growing wheat right now. Uh, for uh, many obvious reasons. Uh, one is uh, we would want to produce food if it became practical in the future for long duration space flight away from Earth. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question will be asked by an 11th grade student here at Winter, Ms. Lauren Arndt. This question is for TJ. There is a research po project called SWAB. Do you have the ability to study microscopic organisms in space, or must all of the samples be returned to Earth for study? Thanks for that, that wonderful question. Since we're in a, an enclosed vehicle, there's a good chance that we can uh, start getting microbes growing, and, and we do, in fact. Um, the answer is best answered in two parts. Oftentimes and periodically, we will take samples um, of our environment around here and see what we can grow. And then we report down to the ground how many colonies we have that, that are growing together and what kind of colonies that they look like they are. That's generally a, a, a gross estimate of how wonderful and how rich the microbes are on station, which we don't always want. The second part of the question, the second part of the answer is there are samples that are specifically trying to target what is actually growing. And after we take the samples and, and we stop the growing process, we can send those down for further study. Uh, so we got, we got both, both halves of that question going in both directions. Thank you, TJ. Our next question will be asked. Oh, I believe that was our last question, Jeff, so I'm going to turn the microphone back over to Dr. Boylow for a wrap up. Thank okay, you, very everybody. Good. Thank you all uh, to all the thank students you, for our wonderful everybody. questions. And Jeff, Soichi, and TJ, thank you for the insightful answers. What an educational experience this morning. We would like to wish Jeff a happy birthday. His birthday is January 19th, so happy birthday, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> so well wishes go out to you. Again, thank you, everybody, for this wonderful experience.
Thank you very much. It was great to have you on board the International Space Station today, and uh, greetings to all my friends and family in the winter area. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants at Winter School. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.